So, this past uh, week, I was at a workshopping conference for artists, and so I know some of you are aware of this. So, for example, Karen Getzinger, uh, she had been asked to give basically a TED Talk. They were called artist sessions, but she was asked to give a TED Talk type thing at this event. It had about a hundred uh, welds. Uh, worship leaders, visual artists, musicians, songwriters, and a handful of pastors thrown in there um, as well. But it was really there specifically for the workshopping of worship leaders and for people planning worship spaces. And so uh, Karen Getzinger gave a fantastic uh, talk on the use of abstract art in contemporary worship spaces. And uh, these videos, uh, or her talk, is going to be turned into a video along with the five other kind of keynotes ones and put online at some point in the future. So as soon as that comes up, I'm going to share it with you. She, it was fantastic. She just did a great, great job. I was also asked to do a workshop there as well. And I just want to uh, give a small glimpse into some of the stuff that I do on these conferences and workshops when I go away. So I'm going to give the workshop to you mainly because it fits very well into the discussions that we have been having, the study that we have been having on law and gospel. So if you remember, we have been going through, this was a long time ago, but we are slowly working through a Bible study called What Do You See? And in that, uh, we are slowly kind of piecing through and talking about law and gospel. And why is law and gospel so important? Let's just start it off this way. Yeah, right? So if you're going to talk about the joy that God gives you, first of all, the joy is found in Jesus, right, in the gospel, in Christ. But in order to fully understand this, you first need the law, right? So these are the two things that work together in Scripture to give us the Christian joy that we have. Other things, why is long gospel so important for Christians? Why is the law and gospel so important to Christians? Maybe we could go about it this way. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about prayer this morning here. Um, is prayer, uh, can prayer strengthen your faith? Yes. yes. Everyone here says yes. So if I say, Lord, give me a red Corvette no. in my prayers, no. 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 Is, my, is my faith being strengthened? So you're going to have to put a little bit, a few caveats on what you're saying. When a Muslim prays to Allah, is that prayer strengthening his faith? No, right? So we have to, we have to be a little bit more specific. So does prayer strengthen your faith? I think Judy. A prayer is like a conversation between God and Jesus, God, from myself, where you're, you're give and take, and there's a conversation, and through that, like any friend, you get So prayer, if we're defining it as a conversation, which is a very good way of going about it, then what's one of the most important parts of it is that we're having the conversation with? Yeah, with the right person, right? With someone that can actually hear our prayers and answer our prayers, right? So we want to talk about the object of our prayer, the person that we're praying to. Robin? Prayer is, well, prayer is also a habit. Yeah. All, all virtues are habits, so so um, we are getting into the, into the routine of conversing with God, I, and very much just like this answer, that's exactly what we do with our relationships, is we, we, we cultivate them. Yeah, so this is huge. Um, whether or not a son talks to his father, is the son still a son to the father? Yes. yes. But is a son going to be able to experience the full benefits of sonship if he never says a word to his father in his life? No, right? So there's a relationship that's built between between you and your father, and the more that there's this habit that's developed of a child talking to a parent, the more then you begin to see the mind of God, we might say. You might begin to uh, 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 experience, or, or experience is maybe the wrong word, uh, you might be able to comprehend the blessings that your father gives you in a way if you're actually listening to his words, right? Um, okay, so that's that's awesome, awesome, good start. Yeah, what else? Well, I think that prayer keeps you mindful of of God and Christ and your relationship. 
relationship with him when you may not have another opportunity. It's something you can do anywhere, anytime. Yeah. And it keeps you mindful of that. So if me praying for a red Corvette in my prayers, if I'm doing that, does that do what you're talking about? Keeps me mindful of the promises of God, builds me up in the knowledge of His uh, law gospel. Off track with the Corvette, What's that? You might be a little off track with the Corvette. But that's still a prayer, right? Or maybe, right. maybe we take out that, you know, that that more silly example. We put in, "Oh Lord, heal, uh, heal my relative that's in the hospital," if right? It is your will. So, if it is your will, if it is your will, so you're adding something there to the prayer. What are you adding? Okay. And how do you know? How do you know that you're leaving it up to God? Because you're asking to heal the person, but you're also saying, Lord, if it is your will, may you. Good, good. So at, at the end of the day, what strengthens faith? There's only one thing that strengthens faith Jesus through the word. His word, right? So the word is the. That, right? So. so all we really have to ask ourselves is, what are the means of grace? What are the means through which you get God's grace? Uh, it's only God's word that strengthens faith. So what needs to be part of your prayer in order for it to be something that actually taps into your faith life? God's word, right? So if you can have a prayer whose content is God's word, then all of a sudden you've got something that's powerful and active. If you take out the active word of God, then you don't really have have anything that we would say is, is spiritually active and powerful in the way that God's word is, right? We've got two different things here. So can you think of a prayer then that you would pray that is God's word? The Lord's Prayer. All right, right? So something like the Lord's Prayer. And what is the Lord's Prayer? It's not simply a list of, of uh, it's not the prayer of just some character in the Bible that's desiring some type of outcome. But instead, it's a list of, Actually, all the gospel promises that, that God gives us in his word, right? It's a succinct promise of everything that is yours through what Christ has done for you. In other words, it is gospel from start to finish, right? There's the forgiveness of sins. There's the building of Christ's kingdom. There's the meeting of all your daily needs. Uh, there's the deliverance from temptation. All these things that are yours through Christ are in that prayer, right? So the point being is that, is that if we're going to talk about a prayer that can strengthen your faith, that can do something for you spiritually, we have to be talking about a prayer that in some way, shape, or form includes law and gospel. That is a prayer that is active in a spiritual sense to actually strengthen your faith. If you take those things out, you might be having a conversation, but it's a one-way conversation. Does that make sense? It's no. then not a two-way con conversation. It's not? Well, I don't know. It's so if you pray to your Lord, minute. if you pray to your Lord, mm -hmm. Uh, Lord, uh, help my relative that's in the hospital. Just that. Yep, if that's your prayer, right, and there's nothing more to oh, it. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Right? Then that's a one-way prayer. Oh, yeah, right? no, okay. Yeah, that's a one-way prayer. That's, that's, that's you just simply appealing to your father. Yeah. Any person, Christian or not Christian, can make that prayer, right? Yeah. Because the active power of God's word, as in Christ's promises, is not present in that prayer in any way, shape, or form. And in that sense, we would say prayer is not something that's active or powerful. Only the means of grace are. So somehow those need to be connected to your prayer life. And when you put that together and you build a habit of your prayer being built on meditation of God's words and promises, then all of a sudden you've got something that's powerful in a way that, that is incomparable to other things in this world. Does that make sense? And I think right at the key to it then, so for example, this is a prayer by a guy named George Herbert. Uh, back in, it's a poem about a prayer uh, in the 1500s. And listen to the way that he speaks to prayer, speaks about prayer here. But instead, don't think prayer here as in, Lord, give me a red Corvette. Or don't think of prayer as, Lord, help my, uh, my relative that's in the hospital. But instead, think of prayer here as a robust prayer that, includes all of the gospel promises that includes both law and gospel and it's it's tied together into this into this unit so a prayer that includes meditation on on what christ has done for you on the forgiveness of sins 
Um, and then the other promises that you find in his word. Now listen to the way that he writes about prayer. Prayer, the church's banquet. Angels age. God's breath in man returning to his birth. The soul in paraphrase. Heart in pilgrimage. The Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth. Engine against the almighty. Sinner's tower. Reverse thunder. Christ's side piercing spear. The six days world transposing in an hour. A kind of tune which all things hear and fear. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss. Exalted manna, gladness of the best. Heaven in ordinary. Man well dressed. The milky way, the bird of paradise. Church bells beyond the stars heard. The soul of blood. The land of spices. Something understood. This is an amazing poem. Just pause for a minute and like take in what he's saying here. In fact, what I would like you to do is in uh, the next three, four minutes here, get together with the people at your table. And on page two, I want you to kind of pull apart some of these things. So... How is prayer, and now we're talking about prayer that includes both law and gospel, so think of something that includes elements of something like the Lord's Prayer. How is it the church's banquet, the soul in paraphrase, and an engine against the Almighty? Okay, think through those three phrases specifically. What in the world could the poet be meaning? And then, when you're done with those three, pick out one more of his little pictures here that you particularly like. Okay? You have three, four minutes. Which means our brains are sharp and fed and they're ready to get work done. Nothing else these days. This experience is cloud. church's banquet, don't say it feeds you. Cliff Bar does that. What do you mean when it says that prayer is the church's banquet? Something about the, the recreated soul here, you know, in the six days in our creation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the prayer is uh, rebuilding of the Christian soul. discuss this for a second here. Huh? Um, the church's banquet. In what way is prayer 
La Gospel Centered Prayer. How's this the church's banquet? If there's going to be law in a prayer, what does that mean there's going to be? Well, there doesn't necessarily need to be gospel. We hope that there's going to be gospel oh. after the law. <laughs> what does that mean, though? If there's law in your prayer, what are you doing? Acknowledging your sins. Yeah, confessing your sins, right? Acknowledging your sins before your God. And if there's gospel in that prayer, what is it? Yeah, right? It's recognizing that despite your sins, God has forgiven you. In what sense is prayer then the church's banquet? Law, gospel, prayer. You know that daily, you know that daily repentance and rebirth that comes with the real right? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. How's that a banquet? Well, you have to be sad every day. I mean, we also, in, in the Lord's Prayer, we, we talk about getting daily bread from God. So, I mean, that whole renewal and refreshing, you're dead in one sense, right? So, um, that's the concept of, um, the way I look at it as food is that the, re the repentance which results in the rebirth is just a refeeding of your soul and the rest of you which you live for the day, right? Yeah, yeah, good. Other thoughts? Please, Dave. Well, uh, Thinking that as a as a member of the Christian Church, and you look at all the all the wonderful things that are laid out before you, yeah. it's like a banquet. Yeah, right. What's the difference between a box lunch and a banquet? <laughs> Variety, quality. <laughs> Variety, quality. What else? How do you feel after a box lunch versus a banquet? How do you feel? Uh, after like a snack versus Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, right, you almost feel sick. You're filled with so much goodness, right? And that's what he's saying here, right? Uh, um, uh, through prayer, you have access to all of God's goodness in all of its form. All of the promises are right there for the taking, right? You can fill yourself up with Everything that you could spiritually desire, it is there to fill you up, right? Through God's word and then through prayer taking it in. Yeah, uh, any other thoughts on it being the church's banquet? That's pretty cool. What about uh, soul and paraphrase? What do you think he means there? Soul and paraphrase. How does prayer take your whole being and put it in paraphrase? Judy. I was just thinking that what you do in prayer is Yeah. I know it all. And it reminds me of uh, the way the Roman Catholics do the confession, where they actually try and go through and remember and itemize yeah. and, and be responsible for all of those little big, all the things that they can remember. Yeah. And uh, they're bearing everything. Yeah, yeah. right. And that, and in a certain sense, that's a, that's a laudable thing, right? Yeah. Like reflecting yeah. on your, your full self, right, before your God. Uh, what were the three uses of the law in catechism class? mirror guide right and so that mirror part is what that is being honest right it's taking a real honest reflection of yourself and who you are in God's law in other words it's seeing your whole self your whole soul accurately according to God's law but so you can see your whole soul accurately according to God's law what do you see about yourself when you look at his gospel <coughs> So on the one hand, you see the fact that your sins ought to separate you from your God. On the other hand, what do you see about yourself? You see that you're made holy. Yeah, right? You see Christ. You see his perfect life clothing you. And so on the one hand, you see your life according to the law, that it should not be going anywhere. You should be on your own in darkness. But according to his gospel, you see what about your life? Redemption. Redemption? That's a very abstract word, Doug. Make it concrete for me. Savior. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean that you are redeemed? What does that mean for your life now? You're a child of God? Why is that important? What does that mean for your life now, that you're a child of God? You're just giving me more labels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see that as a robe of righteousness. Oh. Get all wrapped all around and okay. to be, be perfect. And if you're in the robes of Christ's righteousness, what does that mean for you now? 
Yeah, right. So what does that mean for life? That means you have to worry about the future. Why not? Because you're forgiven. Christ is wrapped around you. Yeah, because you're a child of God. You've got Christ protecting you. Do you have to um, do you have do you have a point in life, a purpose in life? Yeah, what's that point purpose now? Okay, so to share the gospel. That's obvious. What else? Love God. Only obvious because we're, we're all good, you know, because You've been trained them all, but what else, yeah? To love and to know God. Yeah, to love and to know God, right? To use, like, all of your skills and vocations to get to know your God more. What else? Glorify Him. Glorify Him. That's very abstract. How do you glorify God? Well, you make it concrete. Everything you do, you do for the glory of God. So we're getting into vocation, right? So in other words, when you go to work, right? When you're with your family, when you're with your friends, all of a sudden these become opportunities to serve your God through keeping his law as a guide, right? So all of a sudden now, um, through law and gospel in your prayer life, your whole life, both your life before Christ and what you look like apart from Christ and your life with Christ, it all gets boiled down into paraphrase, right? So do you see how that works? Isn't that amazing, right? So your whole being can, can be a part of it. All right, my favorite part, engine against the almighty. In what sense is your prayer life an engine against the almighty well, once, and this really cuts to the heart of the idea of prayer so once you um, once you put in the frame that you're talking about seed casting yeah right, um, I'm reminded of uh, the parable about the woman and the judge where she's <coughs> continually uh, pinging at the guy and finally the judge says I'll give her what she's asking for so I don't you know but yeah. so I don't have to listen to her pleading to me again right but yep. so the, the, the thought that continuous petition and it's not that it turns God but it makes God aware of what it is so when he turns around and responds that you know we're, we're getting a response yeah keep keep wearing away at the stone yeah right the emphasis of that story is not that God is like the judge but rather you should be like the, the person right that is persistent um, or think of uh, we talked about this many times here um, I, I, like this try to drill into you right so when when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer in Luke, what's the very next thing that happens? So his disciples ask him, Lord, teach us to pray just like John the Baptist, men. Uh, disciples uh, asked him to teach them to pray, and, and Jesus then teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And then there's a little story that comes right after it. Remember it? Eventually he's going to say, uh, uh, knock and the door will be open, seek and you'll find. But right before he says that, he has a very similar account so what? Is this where the demons are being cast out, or they're not able to cast them out by their own prayer? Not yet. That's contextually there. The guy, the guy goes to bed with his with his family, and yeah. someone's banging on the door, give me some bread. Right. Yeah. yeah, right? And it's a very similar kind of situation here. And the woman is going to get the bread, right? Because of her persistence, because of her audacity, is how it's sometimes translated. The idea there is that God is saying you can demand from God, uh, or Jesus is saying you can demand from God that he keeps his promises. I just heard a wonderful sermon while I was on vacation uh, by a pastor, um, and the theme of his sermon was, but you said. right? You can go to God and you can hold him to his promises, but Lord, you said. But Lord, you said. And he has to keep his promises. He has to. You can demand them. Not because of your character in any way, shape, or form. Who are you to demand anything from God? But you can demand it because Christ has already made the payment. You can hold God to his word. right? And so in that sense, uh, here we're talking about siege engines, right? Uh, that you can storm the throne of God uh, uh, with your prayers. You can say, but Lord, you promised that my sins would be forgiven. Uh, you promised that you would never leave me or forsake me. You promised that you'd be working all things out for my good. And you can take these things to your Lord in prayer. Um, powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Do you, uh, any of the other ones that you like? Just little pictures of prayer? We haven't even got into the, the meat of this Bible study yet. This is the introduction. Um, anything else you like in there? It's powerful, isn't it? Right, uh, Christian, plummet-sounding heaven and earth. 
this is that's a fantastic picture. Yeah, it's reverse a, thunder. Yeah, reverse thunder. What do you think Power. that means? Power. Yeah. What's reverse thunder? Yeah, right. There's maybe two ways you can picture this. I don't know what George. First of all, we're just interpreting the poem, right? We can't like say for certain what he's talking about here. But there's two ways I think about that reverse thunder. One, like Kathy's saying, one is thunder usually comes, the sound is from heaven down to earth. Prayer is thunder from earth up to heaven, right? So again, kind of uh, uh, supporting this engine against the almighty thing that you can go to your God with powerful, loud, uh, Holy Spirit-driven prayer, right? Um, that's a very powerful picture. The other thing is uh, sometimes, uh, so if thunder follows lightning, right? Uh, maybe he's reversing it there. I don't know. Anywho, it's powerful stuff. This is all to say that um, confession and absolution is a very special type of prayer, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, confession and absolution. So, oh yeah, church's banquet, so I'll paraphrase. All right, so... Confession and absolution would be one of our prime examples. We talked about the Lord's Prayer, but confession and absolution would be another one of these prime examples of, of something that is on the one hand prayer, but yet on the other hand is this prayer that is infused with law and gospel. In fact, that's what that prayer is, right, ultimately. It's a direct, explicit acknowledgement of, of law and gospel. And so when you are confessing your sins, um, and uh, receiving absolution, that beautiful prayer thing that happens up in church, confession and absolution is a direct application of God-breathed revelation. So confession is an explicit use of God's law as mirror to show us our sins, and absolution is an explicit pronouncement of the gospel of forgiveness. So let's define our terms real quick. What are we talking about when we say confession? Yeah, so that's the point um, in either your private prayer life or maybe when we come together corporately where we say to God what? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah, right? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? Where we confess that we're somehow sinful in God's presence, right? What's absolution? God giving it to us and washing Yeah, what does it mean to absolve? Uh, we can get a little stick on here if you want. That you're that you're um, not free from your sin that you're confessing, but you are free from the results of your sin. Yeah, yeah. What were you going to say, Murray? Oh, you declared not guilty. Yeah, right. It's at, to absolve someone is to declare that a slate has been cleaned, right? Uh, that someone has been uh, uh, forgiven, um, not even in the uh, not even in the moral sense, but forgiven as in like a debt, maybe wiped out, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and so the act of absolving, then, is the act of one individual saying to another, you no longer owe me a debt. It's one individual saying to another, I have now forgotten entirely about what you have done in the past. It is now done with. Right? So it's this personal kind of thing. And so absolution, strictly speaking, is the point at when a pastor says... Or when one Christian says to another, I forgive you your sins on behalf of Jesus and by his authority, I say that your sins are forgiven. Right? Where you're speaking for Christ, in a sense. Um, now we're going to lump together, so that's like the very technical term, we're going to lump together just in, into the idea of absolution, just the idea of any time you say your sins are forgiven, right? whatever form that takes, we're going to say that that's absolution. Uh, but absolution, strictly speaking, is you saying, I have wiped your slate clean. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what we've got going on here. And to absolve someone is an explicit pronouncement of the gospel of forgiveness. It is literally to say, in some concrete way, your sins are forgiven. Confession and absolution is commanded by Jesus and the apostles to be a regular part of our lives. Can someone read that to John? passage for us. It's actually first John. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us 
from all unrighteousness. Yeah. So uh, the letter of First John, we spent I don't know what was it three months going through First John. Can you tell me a little bit about it? What's First John about? Spent three months on it. Yeah, you you get off the hook, Kathy. You were uh, in Sunday school, teaching Sunday school. What's First John about? In a nutshell. <laughs> Isn't it about building a relationship with Christ? Yeah. Well, okay. I agree with the first half. Every book of the Bible is ultimately about building a relationship right. with Christ. This one is about building a relationship with the church, right? So 1 John has especially this idea of what a Christian community looks like. Thank you. Uh, and through Christ, how we have now become light in a dark world. Remember that theme, right? And the theme of love, right? We love because he first loved us. And we see this beautiful kind of creation of a Christian community and how a Christian community is very different uh, or, or what looks like a Christian community and what doesn't look like a Christian community and kind of works through this whole thing here. But at the very beginning of this letter that he's going to write about what it looks like to what a Christian community ought to look like, he says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. So what is he assuming implicitly is going to be part of the Christian life? Confession. Yeah, confession, right? This idea of, of confessing your sins recognizing uh, that uh, you need Christ's purification. Right. Um, we find confession and absolution woven throughout the Psalms as a central feature of the warrior poet's prayer life. Uh, the most famous example is Psalm 51. I got that on page 3 there. Um, oh, Judy, if you could just read for us the first few verses. Have mercy on me, Lord. Judy up here. Yeah, go ahead. Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What's he doing there? Yeah, he's confessing his sins. Um, in fact, there's a heading to Psalm 51. Do you remember what that heading is? Why did David write this psalm? Uh, after Bathsheba. Yeah, right? So this is after the prophet Nathan approached David and confronted him about his sins of committing adultery with Bathsheba and murdering her husband Uriah. Okay? All as king of Israel uh, in front of all the people. And so um, so we've got that as the kind of specific sins that are driving uh, David to confess this. Uh, but he also is confessing his, his sinfulness in general, right? Uh, where do you find uh, gospel in there? Just scan that. Yeah, wash away all my iniquity. What does he believe this God that he is praying to is able to do? Forgive. Forgive, right? Where else do you find gospel? According to your unfailing love. Yeah, according to your unfailing love, right? So the God, the God that he is praying to has love that does not fail, and according to that love will forgive him his sins. Where else do you find gospel? My favorite line in it is uh, verse 8 the down there. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. What do you think he means? Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Why? Well, the weight of the sin was down so heavy on him. Yeah. You feel that weight pressing down continually. It's hard to breathe. It's hard to do everything right. Yeah. And so with the weight's been lifted off of him so he can he can breathe again and, uh, <coughs> and stand up on his own. David has been crushed by God's law and now those crushed bones are able to rise and rejoice. <coughs> Right, so both law and gospel images in there. This is just Psalm 51. Um, Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 69, and then I got uh, then I, then I got uh, tired of reading. Um, there's far more <laughs> that come after that. Um, I had to move on. Um, yeah, but those are just at least some of them where you find this very kind of clear interplay between either con or confession and absolution taking place. Um, <clears throat> confession and, and absolution is a special exercise of the so, uh, in classic art, whenever you see a picture of Peter, what else do you usually see in the picture with him? It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, a key. Why? Why are there keys always in the picture with Peter? Give me the keys of the church. Yeah, the keys of the church. Where, what's this from? The accounts in, in the Gospels? Well, when Christ says, then whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth. And 
found in heaven and whatever you forgive, yeah. you're forgiven. Yeah. Right? And what's the story that's taking place there? What's Peter just done? Do you remember? Jesus, Jesus says to his disciples, some people say I'm a prophet, Elijah. Who do you say I am? Right, so he just he said, "You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." And Jesus' response to that is, "Yeah, your name is now going to be Peter, which means rock, because I'm going to build my church on you." And what's he saying there? Is he saying that he's going to build the papacy? Yeah, think a little bit more biblical. What's he What's he going to do? Yeah, on his confession, the apostles are part of that, right? So the testimony of the apostles sharing the gospel, but on this confession that Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to build his church. And then he adds uh, to it, uh, whatever you bind on earth will be uh, bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so that binding and loosing, that language there, right, that's where we get this idea of uh, Christians having keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, what in the world does it mean that you have a key to the kingdom of heaven, that you can open heaven's doors and that you can close it. Jesus says this at the end of his ministry as well. So I'm going to read that John 20, 23. Doug, read that here. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. <coughs> if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What? That's, so Jesus is saying, if you say to someone, your sins are forgiven, what happens? Okay. Their sins are forgiven. Notice what he does not say here is, if you forgive someone their sins, they are reminded that Jesus has forgiven their sins on the cross, past tense. Instead, it says, if you forgive someone their sins, their sins are forgiven. This is active. How is it possible for you to forgive sins? Wait. Tell me a little bit more about this gospel that you're preaching. What's unique about God's word when you share it with someone and the gospel falls on their ears? Is it like any other type of language in this world? What's special about it? It creates faith. What's that? It creates faith. It creates faith. It's active. It's powerful. The Holy Spirit himself is working through those words. And so God is giving you a gospel message that literally is able to accomplish something as you speak it. So we understand that historically Jesus died for sins 2,000 years ago, but when you share the gospel with someone and you say, through Jesus your sins are forgiven, something is actually happening at that point. You are actually swinging open, in a sense, the gates of heaven to that person. The Holy Spirit is creating faith that clings to those promises. It is active, it is alive, it is really doing something. And so that's what we mean when we say that Christians have the keys. Not simply that you have been given the task of simply announcing some historical fact that's taken place, but that you are now bearers, you are now the ministerial tools, is the language that some theologians use, you are now the ministerial tools that God uses to accomplish his work of forgiveness. It's obviously not you that does the forgiving of sins. It's the Holy Spirit through God's word, through the, the life and death of Christ, right, that does everything. But you are the tool through which that means of grace is being delivered when you pronounce to someone, your sins are forgiven. That means you have the ability to do amazing things as this tool of God. Yeah. This is the second part of that verse. Yeah. Does that, that, that implies that the people are unrepentant and just announcing the law? Yeah, right? So this would be something that we see clearly being applied in First and Second Corinthians, right? So First Corinthians, when you have the, uh, man, the incestuous man that's sleeping with his mother-in-law, um, what does Paul say to that person? Or what does he tell the congregation to say to that person? Well, they exclude him in order for him to become aware of the depth of his sin so that he can turn around, repent, and come back. Yeah, so... 
Likewise, just as you have been given the power of God's gospel that can really create faith, you are really also the bearers of God's judgment against sin when you bear the law against people. And that is just as active and, and real in your pronouncement as the other. Now, it's only active and real insofar as you are lining up with the will of God, right? You can't just have a grudge against your friend and say, uh, the, the gates of heaven are closed to you, right? Um, that doesn't do anything in any way, shape, or form. But when you are a faithful bearer of God's gospel and God's law in the, in the proper context, then you are the tool through which God is, on the one hand, either uh, bringing judgment on someone or the pronouncement of judgment on someone or... On the other hand, strengthening your faith and forgiveness. So, in a very real sense, then, right, uh, you have keys. Yeah, Murray. Can I have some? Just to limit being difficult. Yes, okay, no, so, please, um, take away. The, the, the thing is, on that, if you take that to its extreme, and you take that into public life, right, and so I'll use a couple of, these, a couple of examples. So, you have public figures politicians, for example, and we'll use uh, the, those that are nominally members of the Catholic Church yeah. that teach openly against things which are the teachings of the Church. Now, what has always amazed me is, is because it's been abused, in the Middle Ages it was abused seriously, like the Pope would say, oh, well, he would he would excommunicate someone because that person, actually, because of his territorial, his temporal uh, escape would be in conflict, and so he would sometimes excommunicate a ruler in order to Force the concessions that he wanted politically, but in yeah. the modern world where we don't have the temporal side of the church, and so it's always amazed me that the church leaders are unwilling to do, which is the obvious thing, which is to exclude someone from the fellowship of the church and say, "Okay, fine, you may call yourself a Catholic, but you're you're denied communion, you know, you're denied marriage, you're denied Christian burial, which are all things that, that can be done for a person who's unrepentant from sin." Yeah. In the same way, the Protestant Church, as all of our churches, we tend not to speak openly, and actually your father's book is part of my thinking on this, when we have Christians who are heretics, like modern modern Christians who actually are devoted to heresy, they've denied the Trinity, they've denied other stuff. So we're not actually following this. Well, we, we, we always narrow this down to be the one-on-one -on -one aspect in the whole Matthew 18 thing. I, and I get that, but there's this whole other aspect of the church proclaiming the truth where we're very reluctant to actually publicly state clearly what is wrong with, you know, with the teachings of our fellow Christians or the conduct of our, of our members in public life or whatever. And, and private things are one thing, but once a person steps into a public space, there's a different dynamic. So do you have any comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so so um, the context here that's taking place is that is that this is coming at the very end of the gospel. So what what specifically is does Jesus have in mind when he's talking about the use of these keys? What's his disciples about to go out and do? Start the Christian Start church, the church right? right? Begin yeah. the Christian church, yeah. right? And so the context that we're talking about here is they're going out and they're now sharing law and gospel and creating congregations, right? So um, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's far easier. So these keys can be abused like nobody's business, either in the sense of not using them when you should or using them when you should, right? Um, and we've got scripture that helps guide this, so to speak, but it's far easier in a church family <laughs> when you know someone, when you know their backgrounds, and you know the circumstances and what's going on, to be able to uh, use these keys correctly, right? The congregational kind of family structures <coughs> serves that purpose well. It's a little harder if you have someone that uh, is... is um, so, for example, a public figure in politics to use the binding key on them mm -hmm. to go so far as to bind them out of God's kingdom uh, to declare that, mm -hmm. rather than just to simply say, um, on the surface, let it be understood that what they are teaching is contrary to Scripture, and we need to, in some way, uh, address this, right? 
Um, and so, so that's a little simpler, right, to do rather than say this person is outside the kingdom of God. Right? See that distinction there? And I think on the one hand, um, our church body at least tries to take steps of being able to say this this teaching or this policy, if it clearly uh, uh, disagrees with God's law, if it's against God's law, then we stand opposed to it and we shouldn't be shy of opposing it. But it's another thing to say that this person's outside the kingdom of God because we don't know no, specifically what the person... So right, I'm going to just link yeah. this right because what yeah. we do is we accept people as members of our church on the basis of, of their public proclamation. Right. Yeah. So when we have people who are publicly proclaiming something that goes against the teachings of the church, yeah. and we know, right, and like, and so I understand this is not us in the end. We, we can't exercise in the same way that we can with a congregational member, but what we sort of tend to do is our reluctance to publicly state a counter position to yeah. someone's publicly stated position that is clearly against church teaching. Yeah. You know, are we compromising, our, and, and, I, and I say this honestly, and I'm not saying it's easy in any way, are we compromising our own stand, the, um, the veracity of everything that we do by not, by not following through in the, in, in the public sphere? And I'm not talking about us taking worldly power, because yeah. that's not the issue here right. at all. The issue is, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when the prophets used to when the prophets in Israel yeah. used to take a stand, they would they would publicly be calling out the rulers of the kingdom and saying, your life is sinful, what you're doing is wrong, it's counter to God's will, it's going to end up in this kind of a situation. And they would, yeah. and we accept that as God's word, that that's a, a faith, that they were faithful in doing so, and that the faithful witness is to everything. So I, yeah. I didn't want to track this no, no. off, but yeah. I just, you know. <laughs> I would, uh, if the question is, uh, are we rather weak spined when it comes to standing up for God's truth in the public sphere? Absolutely. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's just stuff to think about, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, when we're talking about cues, though, isn't it um, that we're we're proclaiming for the world that Jesus died for your sins? And if you, if you believe that, then you are saved. If you do not believe it, then you're not. And I'm basically talking about justification. So if these other yeah. issues, it's more getting into the sanctification, the, the sanctified life of a church or a group or an individual. And doesn't that kind of muddy the water? I mean, the, to me, the keys are saying that you are are justified through Christ. Yeah, so so I think we can have that conversation, right? Um, um, but I would say the use of the keys, the idea here isn't a, a wide kind of proclamation. We do that in a church service, but only because we assume that we're gathered together as a family, we know each other, and we're in a context where we can talk right openly about our sins with each other and confess our sins together. The use of the keys, what we're here talking about is you saying to another individual, your sins are forgiven, or you're going to hell if you keep doing this. Right? That's that's what we're talking about with, with uh, the keys. That this is a very kind of one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano, um, right? Or, uh, or a Christian with their community, with people that they know, and they have the background information to be making these proclamations. Does that make sense? Um, as opposed to the idea of Confession and absolution doesn't quite as much have, have to do with, with what happens outside of the person that you are confessing and the person you're receiving absolution from. Does that make sense? But so here the key is what we're saying is you can say to someone your sins are forgiven and sins are going to lead you to hell. Right? Those two settings. So yeah. but, I, but I think the difference really is you were saying that you're say to somebody, your sins are forgiven, or if you continue doing what you're doing, your sins are sending you to hell. Right. Isn't it really that if you don't accept the fact that Christ died for your sins, 
we're going to hell. Not that you yeah. continue, because if we accept Christ sure. in our heart, then we don't stop sinning. No, but the difference, Lee, is that what you're what what you're talking about is the repentant life, which is different, right? right? So the That's thing right. is, okay, I've committed a sin, I acknowledge my sin, I repent of my sin, I fall, and I will fall down tomorrow and commit possibly the same sin again and again. That's one thing because that's a repentant heart that's that's struggling with the realities that's of the, the flesh. Life sanctification. That that's right, and that's a process. And that's separate. From that's sin. separate from. I, I think it's separate where you have someone who, you know, doesn't acknowledge that they're sinful, right? I'm doing something that's sinful, right. but I don't acknowledge it's sinful. So therefore, we can walk. You know, we say, well, on the basis of you not accepting your sin and not repenting of your okay. sin, okay. then then God's judgment rests upon you because you have not turned away and accepted Christ's mm -hmm. forgiveness. That's right. where the, the difference comes in. And this is why I made the point about the public proclamation yep. of stuff versus where we are. Because we all lead, lead that life every day where we struggle with our faith and our everything. But our hearts may be, as Paul points out, I mean, Paul's heart is trying to do what's in his heart. He wants to do what's right and he can't do it. That's a life that's in the process of sanctification as far as that. It's the other ones where you get... I'm throwing this yeah. out, throwing that out, throwing that out. No, I'm taking that. I'll take 80% of what's here. I'll take some social aspects. And I won't. That's when yeah. you start getting into issues that I think this actually does apply in some sense it because they will, they will say, I'm a Christian, but I mean, I don't want this inconvenient stuff. Let's put that to the side because that's really what's happening, right? Your, your life is an evidence. Of your life, life is evidence that, you are, that you're not repentant. Right? So, for example, in the First Corinthians case, Paul says, if this person does not stop sinning, Right? Correct. They are outside the kingdom of God. Right? Correct. He's directing it towards this sin. So, do we have people in our society that are committing a specific sin um, and are claiming to be Christian at the exact same time? And that's what, right? And, and we do, right? Um, now, we want to be sensitive with that. But I also want to move on. Okay, yeah, we want to be sensitive yeah. to the issue. Yeah. Uh, but we live in a country that has chosen uh, to, to, you know, to accept homosexuality, killing babies. Uh, so it's hard for a person to be in the public, and they've got to support that. Th those views, you know, if you're in the like, the, yeah, you know, you're saying that it's a uh, it's a tough line to walk. Yeah, yeah, and a good example is how do the Old Testament judges? Well, yeah. <laughs> in the political sphere, we, and I hate to do this, but I'll just, just to sort of close this out, if you're part of a member of the Liberal Party and you run for office in the Liberal Party, it's stated within the party policy that you have to accept certain things, which are clearly sinful. And so how can you as a member of the church in any way, shape, or form, and there used to be Christians in the Liberal Party who would fight against that, but how can you in good conscience then consider, accept a membership or adhere to a membership in a party which advocates something which is clearly non-Christian and clearly runs against the thing of the Bible. That's where we start running into issues yep. of this sort, right? And I, and I don't care what political party, I'll just use that because I know what's in the party policy. And right. you, could, yep. you could insert another name there, it yep. wouldn't make any difference. Perfect. Good. 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 All right, we're going to move on. Um, so confession absolution, it's a use of the keys. So when you confess your sins in church and when you receive absolution, uh, something is really happening at that point. Your faith is literally being built up and strengthened on the gospel promises of God. It's not simply a reminder that your sins are forgiven. You are growing in, uh, in, uh, in your faith life there. Um, the Didache then. So this, the Didache was a worship document. It describes how Christians were worshiping and gathering together. It has some other things in it as well. And it's dated to as early as maybe 90 AD, uh, 85 AD in that range. And so if it is that early, then that means this was written and was circulating at the same time as John's Gospel, as, as the actual New Testament uh, was not even finished being written at this time. Um, and so it's not inspired scripture, but it gives us a glimpse into some of the instructions that were taking place back then. And it's, it's a fun read if you go and read it on your own. But what's interesting is that in the Didache, then, it says this line. On the Lord's own day, gather together and break bread and give thanks, having first confessed your sins. And so what this does not say is that 
on the Lord's own day, gather together in a corporate worship setting and publicly together confess your sins and publicly together receive absolution. It's not very specific in what this looks like, but it is saying that part of corporate Christian life in some way, shape, or, shape, or form, somehow part of what it meant to be a practicing Christian back then was that confession was part of it, either private confession or maybe public, I don't know, but but the idea is that confession was recognized as somehow being part of the active life of a Christian at the time of John, okay? um, which is amazing to think about. What happened then is that over the course of the next 1,500 years, uh, what we see and we know historically is that there was not this public confession of sins like we do in church today at times where everyone comes together and says, um, I'm a sinner. Instead, what the norm was, not necessarily universally, but the norm what was most widely practiced throughout Christian history was private confession, regardless of denomination, church body, traditions, whatever. But the idea is when it says the word, you're going to confess your sins, what it meant is that you would either privately confess them to to Christians among each other, or you would go to your priest, um, or to your pastor, or whoever it was, and you would privately confess your sins. For what years did the, for yep. what years did the Lutherans have the private confession? Right, so private confession was the norm during the time of the Reformation. Okay. Okay. I'll okay. touch on the changes then that kind of took place. Um, priestly public, con so the priest publicly confesses uh, his sins before Mass was the wide practice of at least from 700 AD on. So right before communion would take place, the priest would publicly confess his sins and receive absolution, and then they would have communion. So they, not everyone publicly confessed, but the priest would at least do it in front of everyone. And so that was the practice up until the time of the Reformation. In the 16th century then, when Lutherans were doing confession and they were doing church, Confession was still private at that time, and then there was a moment of public absolution that took place in the church service, but there was a deliberate move in the 16th and 17th centuries by the Lutheran theologians at that time to begin introducing public confession. So they were will willingly, willfully trying to introduce this in, but if you were to look up the very first Lutheran uh, Lutheran liturgies like Luther's Deutsche Messe and things like that, you would not find a public confession in there. Um, that wasn't going to become the norm until about 100 years later. Um, and so that's kind of the history that we're talking about here. And so maybe just one more note to add on to it before we leave. Uh, oh man, we're out of time. Okay. Um, no, we'll have to pick this up next time. I'm going to have a little discussion about this. All right. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your own active and powerful word of God that when we go to you in prayer, and in that prayer is law and gospel, we are tapping into your means of grace that those words have the power to forgive sins, have the power to strengthen our faith, have the power to shape us, uh, to conform us more to your image. We thank you for giving us that. We also thank you for our ability to come together as Christians in church and confess and receive absolution and that that is powerful and active as well. We thank you for the forgiveness we have through you. We thank you that we get to hear regularly that our sins are forgiven. Thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. And confession and absolution is not necessary in the church service. It's necessary to say in church service for communion, but not in absolutely every church service. So today, ironically, it's one of our ones that we do not have.